Great. Um, thank you for everyone for joining again. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Erin Stafford and I head the North American CMBS group for DBRS Morningstar. Joining me today, I have Christian Offsets who heads the European Structured Finance Group for DBRS Morningstar and also Kevin Augustine, who is a senior analyst in the North American CMBS group. Both Christian and Kevin have been working diligently on our ESG efforts. And so today what we'd like to do is talk to you about where we are with as it relates to ESG efforts uh, and how it relates to commercial real estate and CMBS. Um, today, we're gonna to go through obviously the, the company-wide initiatives that we have, the eight factors that we're considering in uh, global structured finance, and then also really focus today on the E factor within ESG as it relates to commercial real estate. Uh, going forward in subsequent webinars, we'll talk more specifically about the S and the G, uh, but you know that, that's too much material for one webinar. So we'll get started. I think you know for, for all of you joining today, Morningstar has been very active in this space, um, Morningstar being our parent company. And as a result, also DBRS Morningstar has been taking a very active role uh, in this space as well. We have a number of uh, steering committees, not only across our, our firm globally, but also within North American CMBS and then also across global structured finance. Um, so why don't we flip to slide uh, two and as I mentioned, we've got several folks focused on this and you know, ESG investing or socially responsible investing, it's not new. You can actually find roots in it back, dating back to the 1960s, um, specifically maybe as it relates to uh, investing in companies that have fair labor market practices and, and things like that. But in the recent years or the past decade, it's really grown exponentially. Kevin, maybe do you wanna give us a little insight as to maybe why that um, has really taken off in the last few years? Uh, sure. Thanks, Aaron. This is a really exciting area. And as you can see by this chart, it has grown uh, dramatically over the last 14 or 15 years. And, and obviously just much more attention paid to it over the last year as a lot of events have unfolded. Uh, the United Nations has a program called the Principles for Responsible Investing. And was started by a group of investors and over the years uh, more people have signed on to it to uh, to promote and adopt some of these principles and you see uh, from the chart the growth in membership over the years and over the last year much much more attention has been paid to this uh, just because of uh, a lot of events certainly the the spread of the covid virus began to get people thinking more about healthy buildings you had the uh, social unrest over the summer after George Floyd. You had the uh, increased uh, weather and climate events that have become very apparent to people. Uh, certainly focused uh, last week on the problem with the power grid in Texas. So all of these issues around the environment, around climate, around social change have, uh, have moved us into a much, much, much greater awareness and interest in this type of investing, not only among retail investors and individuals, but uh, for institutions as well. So uh, we, we set this up today to really focus on the environmental factors, but wanted to give you a little bit of background into how DBRS approaches this. It's a little bit different if you have done any, any reading or, or research on uh, socially responsible investing, corporate responsibility, environmental social governance investing. There's this notion about what are the characteristics of a company that make it a good citizen and how does it positively affect the world? Our approach is a little bit different. We're looking at risk factors that would uh, affect either the sponsor or the underlying credit or the collateral for a particular transaction. So in the, our work, uh, we'll, I'll have Christian uh, jump in and, and go over some more of our process in detail. But basically, we have, uh, in our original research, identified 18 factors across all of our business lines that we thought could pose a risk to, uh, in some way, to the credit. But for purposes of structured finance and 
our CMBS group, we have focused on eight factors, which we'll discuss in some detail, detail later. These are factors that in some way have characteristics that could affect uh, positively or negatively the, the credit that we uh, are, are examining here at, at DBRS. So Christian, do you wanna talk a little bit more about the process that we've gone over in the last couple of years and, and where we are today? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, sure. So, um, so thank you, Kevin. So yeah, as, as, as you mentioned, um, I think it is um, important when looking as, as a rating agency at ESG and considering um, what is our business in grading credit risk. Um, it's very important to differentiate between grading ESG in itself, like how sustainable, ethical or responsible are an issuer's operations or policies, that is grading ESG. But from a rating agency perspective, we are focusing on credit and um, look at it from a perspective, to what extent are there ESG factors which affect the credit worthiness of an issuer, be it um, the financials, the cash flows, um, refinancing flexibility. So, um, which by itself means there are a lot of ESG factors which do not affect credit. Um, <clears throat> so, and those are in our analysis basically ultimately blended out because uh, we want to really see, okay, there's an ESG factor. It, uh, it can affect credit and indeed affected our credit view and potentially it affected our rating. Um, also bringing a little bit here the European perspective. So uh, European regulators are um, uh, very much focused on ESGs uh, in itself and um, want rating agencies to comment whenever there was an ESG factor affected ultimately the rating. So, um, and that certainly was also um, to some extent um, driving our view on that. So considering um, structured fines in particular, because um, ESG in itself is very, it has its origin in corporate finance and not necessarily structured finance. Um, because many of the concepts of especially um, the governance and um, on the social side are based on going concern entities. There might be an ESG risk the company has to address and it might be managed or not. Whereas in structured finance, we would, um, and uh, in particular in CMBS, we deal with a uh, discrete portfolio of assets and core to our analysis uh, for, um, for the rating is the portfolio analysis. So there are usually two ways how structured finance portfolio analysis can um, consider ESG factors. One is um, via quantitative analysis. And I think there we are at the very early part of our journey um, that we can really see based on historical data whether certain ESG characteristics have a different default or recovery pattern. So that will evolve over time. Um, but Technically, it can then be incorporated in the quantitative analysis. Um, there are emergent environmental, social, but also um, governance considerations, which in the credit analysis for a CMBS transaction can be considered qualitatively, given there is not yet enough um, historical data. Um, qualitative in a way, forward-looking, saying, okay, there is this emergent factor. Uh, let's consider that in the credit analysis. Um, we we'll go to the next slide. So that is um, taken out of our uh, criteria and is really to illustrate two things. One, um, where in structured finance on the credit analysis side, ESG could affect the credit view. And um, ultimately it's either the underlying collateral or the portfolio of the assets which are backing the loan collateral, like commercial real estate properties. But then you also have the other element that there are um, many third parties involved in the structured finance transactions, the originator, the servicer, um, guarantors, sponsor, which the assessment of those um, also affects credit analysis and structured finance. And the assessment of these parties might have ESG considerations already that indirect effect in structured finance. Um, 
um, in addition to the direct effect of the portfolio of assets. So whenever we look at um, a structured finance transaction, um, the flow chart um, is basically to show how our thinking um, from ESG to credit goes. So there are many ESG factors and um, Kevin mentioned um, we identified um, 17 out of which eight are relevant for structured finance. But ultimately there are many, many ESG considerations out there in the world. And the first question is, does this affect the cash flow, um, which is um, ultimately um, for the benefit of the structured finance investor? If not, then it's an ESG factor, but it doesn't have any bearing of cred on credit because it's credit irrelevant. If it does um, affect credit um, or the cash flows, we ask or ask the second question, to what extent? So how, how did we incorporate that into our analysis? Um, is there a difference in our cash flow expectations with this ESG factor compared to how would be the world without this ESG factor? And at that point in time, it becomes relevant for the credit view. And then the third question is, was it relevant enough to ultimately also affect the rating? So you might well be in a situation, you have an ESG factor affecting the credit analysis positively or negatively, but only at the margin and not enough to change the ultimate rating outcome. And that is uh, based on the criteria, the three-step approach um, we are following to look at credit also from an ESG lens as ultimately a rating agency and not a third party who is assessing ESG risk in itself. So Kevin. Great. Think, uh, so what we'd like to do is uh, talk to you a little bit in some detail about the characteristics of the environmental factors. Just to give you the, the, the brief introduction, uh, we, we mentioned that there were eight factors that we looked at related to uh, CMBS and structured finance transactions. And so the three environmental topics that we'll talk about more in detail now are emissions, effluence, and waste, essentially areas around pollution, carbon and greenhouse gases, essentially, uh, in our, in our mind, this gets around to the point of how energy efficient buildings are and how they affect the climate generally. And then the broader uh, climate and weather risk. So we've certainly seen uh, evidence of this in terms of, as I mentioned, the power grid in Texas, some other factors, we'll talk about that in some detail. Just to give you a little bit of a preview of what we think will, of what the factors are regarding social and, and governance, we'll talk about these in a later webinar. And those were uh, the social impact of the products and services. Uh, how do we, how does the, the credit, how is the credit affected by human capital and human rights, product governance, data and private security, and then finally uh, transaction governance. But today we wanna to focus on, on the environmental uh, aspects and talk about those a little bit in some detail. So this is, is, this is the, the notion of emissions, effluence and waste generally categorized as, as pollution and contaminants is an interesting factor in that it illustrates that a, a credit rating agency like DBRS Morningstar has been incorporating this kind of analysis for some time. And it's a bit more formalized now under our ESG criteria, but we have always looked at the environmental condition of the underlying collateral of our property. So through fairly well-recognized examples, uh, phase one reports, phase two reports, uh, no further action letters, all the things that go into providing some environmental risk profile for the property, we, we have done and will continue to do and give some attention to how these events might uh, affect cash flow. So I, I wanted to show f a few examples of uh, some things that might come into play. And I think that the, the danger for some of these environmental issues is if you're involved in real estate, you have probably come across some of the ones that are mentioned here that are pretty basic. We know about underground storage tanks and their potential to leak. To leak. Uh, we know that some dry cleaners were um, not very precise in how they were disposed, how they disposed of some of their uh, 
their dry cleaning chemicals. So these are the things that we, we know about, we see often, we know how to deal with. Even in this day and age, for all the attention and time we've placed on environmental issues, there's still things that pop up that are really unique and, and interesting. And so this is not necessarily a simplistic process. Uh, I'll just share with you a couple examples. There's a fairly well publicized project in Chicago that uh, a site that was proposed for a major hospital expansion, the uh, phase one reports, all the pre-work was done, everything was ready to go. And then it was discovered that historically this site had been used in manufacturing gas mantles and was in fact contaminated with radioactive thorium. No, uh, no phase one report uh, would have really candidly probably thought to look for radioactive thorium. So it was a big deal and it was costly to remediate, but was done. But as an example of things that are, are still gonna come up and will still be relevant, even though we've been doing environmental assessment for a long time. A similar example, uh, redevelopment of a, a, a high school. It looked to be a pretty cut and dry kind of development, nothing really strongly expected. And then the, um, the environmental report showed uh, high levels of contamination of with heavy metals, thor, uh, cadmium, and other chemicals. And it was because the high school was a industrial arts high school that actually had a working foundry as part of the training program, and that's where all this contamination came from. So we, as uh, as analysts and underwriters, will continue to uh, be very diligent about looking at all the environmental information about a site, uh, thinking about not only its current condition, but also thinking about what uh, what future uses might be done there. If it's an office building, you're probably not too worried, but if it's industrial, manufacturing, some other processing plant, there are some things that might, might happen in the future that we'd wanna be aware of. The, uh, the second uh, topic within the environmental uh, framework is the notion of how do we assess the risk of, of carbon and greenhouse gases? So for our purposes, we know there's a little bit of, a, of, a, of an overlap with the next factor, which is climate and weather, because we know that carbon and greenhouse gases can have an effect on the climate as well. But in our case, we are looking more specifically at the collateral, the underlying collateral for the property. And one of the things that we will um, look at is uh, whether or not a building is designed to be energy efficient. And so our primary research and, and data point at this particular time on these is to look at whether these buildings have thought about becoming more energy efficient, whether they have some of the certifications that uh, in terms of materials and in terms of operating practices and in terms of design that might make these um, might make these better or worse or in some way uh, and then properly take into account any energy savings and, and operating expenses that might happen. So in the United States, you know, we, we talked about our phase one process. We talked about what we do for pollution. We certainly are, uh, are looking at uh, these examples of how do we treat greenhouse gas and how do we treat the operating efficiency of buildings. I, I wanted Christian to give a little bit of uh, color on how this uh, maybe is the same or, or maybe is different in Europe. And then we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about climate change. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So I see um, carbon and uh, GHG costs as the two things that you mentioned, um, there is a focus on how does the land plan to make the building fit for purpose. And then if not successful, or if it is simply not fit for purpose and becomes um, not acceptable to buyers or lenders in relation to carbon and uh, GHG emissions, then that is a negative and might be factored into um, the analysis by forward-lookingly applying higher yield to this. Um, but there's also the other side of the coin, um, which is do buildings which have a certification 
um, would they um, in the future or currently price at a premium? And is that something if you have an outstanding um, certification about um, energy efficiency, whether that would warrant a more optimistic credit view? And we actually had that situation um, early last year for um, a French CMBS, which was actually in Europe the first green CMBS bond. So it got the label of being green. And the ultimate um, property securing the loan was an um, highly energy certified um, building, office building in a suburb of Paris. And there in the committee, we discussed should we, um, should we set our DBRS value higher because of this certification. And we looked at it from an angle of obviously it's very positive from an ESG perspective, but we did not feel and still do not feel that this would currently warrant a lower cap rate or yield. And that's something I mentioned earlier, once it is seen in data that you have um, environmental consideration as being um, a discriminating factor in yields, and I'm sure it will come over time, then um, that is something we would certainly consider. Um, right now we look at it case by case, and that particular case we just thought yeah, it's a green building and it's great, but we still didn't like the location. <laughs> um, so it didn't make it a prime building. Um, and so we did not adjust for that. But that's just, I think, illustrates some um, the two flip sides of ESG. It can be a risk, but it can also be a benefit in the analysis, um, which can be positively for credit. Thanks, Christian. And, and I think it's, Christian stated it's important to notice that we, uh, when we take into consideration all these 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 factors, we are looking at how they affect the credit and the primary way, not the only way, but the primary way that we look at this analysis is in terms of how would it ultimately affect cash flow. And so, there are certainly characteristics of properties that come up that are important. We need to look at those. We, we, we think that they should be considered, but not all of them are at the level where it would actually affect cash flow and, and then even a step further actually affect the credit rating. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the third environmental factor, which is climate and weather risk. Uh, you know, personally, I think the climate and weather risk is probably one of the most important and maybe currently um, one that needs the most attention in terms of how we incorporate it into our, our, our credit ratings. There has been uh, so much in the, 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 the press and there have been so many world events over the last even two years, one year, that have pointed out the, the issues around climate change. If you think back even over the, the last year, you've seen uh, unprecedented levels of wildfires in California. You've seen uh, extreme areas of examples of coastal flooding, not only along uh, our, our ocean fronts, but also in the Great Lakes as well. We have seen uh, the, the problems with the electric grid, uh, the power grid in Texas due to uh, weather that is rarely the type of weather, temperatures and snow that happens there. So. There are increasing examples and increasing events that are making people, uh, investors, individuals, users of buildings, more aware of, of climate risk. And so this is an important component and it is one that we take, uh, we take seriously. And there are uh, a, a few examples I can give you on how we would begin to incorporate that. You know, certainly uh, there are uh, there is attention paid to whether or not properties are in or near flood zones, whether they are in or near wildfire file areas, uh, certainly paying particular attention to uh, California and the Gulf Coast and some parts of the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean where uh, there are trends in, in rising sea levels that would affect the use of property. And there are certainly uh, much more attention being paid to insurance rates because insurance rates are uh, increasing fairly dramatically in some of these coastal areas. So climate and weather risks 
a, uh, a, very real, uh, a very real example. And I think that you'll see as we go forward, uh, better and better uh, data and reporting and transparency. Uh, there are a number of firms now that have developed very sophisticated models that can uh, provide certain levels of assessment and probability to catastrophic events, which uh, you know, we take into consideration. So uh, again, uh, an important factor. So in, in our work here, we certainly within the E factor, you know, focus on these three areas. The other thing that uh, we'll talk about in a bit are some of the more uh, broader issues in environmental related factors that we as, as a company uh, continue to study and that we want our staff to be aware of as they go forward because it helps us look at some of these more specific rating decisions in the context of some of the broader uh, environmental trends uh, that are, that are happening. So uh, before we leave climate and weather risk though, I wanted to give uh, Christian a chance to talk about some of the, the European perspective. It's as I think some of you might suspect, uh, there are some aspects of, of ESG investing that are uh, far more advanced in Europe than they are right now in the United States. So I wanted to uh, give Christian a chance to talk about some of those uh, issues as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think on climate and weather risks, um, I would not have to add a lot from a European perspective, obviously it's exactly the same topics and questions we ask ourselves. Um, it's certain areas are more prone to flooding. Um, I think here it then becomes very interesting to see the thinking process of yeah, flooding, but usually there's an insurance, but it then also is ultimately very important to analyze exactly that insurance, are there carves out, um, does it ultimately help? But um, it's certainly a topic we have here as well. Similarly, um, rising sea levels. I would, I often say um, the climate and weather risks, it also depends on the time horizon. So that's, um, I think also when thinking of ESG and credit, it's also important to put timing into a perspective. So you can have a long-term ESG factor, which ultimately might affect credit or collateral, but how relevant is it over a one or two year horizon already? So, and I think um, that's also one consideration to, to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, climate weather risks in Europe are exactly the same risks. <laughs> um, certain areas, flooding, um, rising sea levels, and then um, yeah, the adverse, potentially adverse weather conditions uh, more in the south of Europe um, due to to global warming, uh, like south of Spain, etc. So it's certainly something we look at uh, case by case. Thanks, and you know, I want to mention too. So we think of this generally in terms of uh, you know significant weather events, floods, uh, tornadoes, those type of issues. But the other issue here that that gets that's getting more attention is the issue of temperature. So uh, there are some what have historically been very accurate models that have talked about how uh, increases in what's generally referred to as 100, the number of 100 plus days in a given region, that this, this, this area, this issue of uh, certain parts of the country, certain parts of the world becoming much hotter than they are and, and how that affects economies and, and how to some extent it might even affect, uh, affect migration patterns as well, because some places will just be uh, too hot to, uh, to continue to grow and, and, and be popular. So uh, that's a little bit of an overview on how we look at the three specific factors that were identified uh, by DBRS Morningstar for our analysis of credit risk. I did wanna spend a little bit of time uh, in general talking about some things that we think are important. And again, we, uh, we, we like for our analytical team to not only be versed in uh, the specifics of our criteria and, and how we, we rate these, but also to be able to um, think in a more broadly broader way and taking into uh, account some of the, the broader trends and, and issues in, and, in ESG factors. And so, you know, we do that through a number of ways, but I uh, wanted to highlight some things that we thought were gonna be particularly important going forward and that could help give some context to some of our, our specific criteria. So I wanted to mention a little bit 
this whole idea of green building design and, and net zero emission goals. So I, I don't want this to become a, a, you know, a class necessarily in each of these, but I thought it'd be interesting to think about how some of these things have evolved. So when we think about green building design, we originally looked at this almost purely from a uh, energy efficiency standpoint. The lead, for example, lead certifications, silver, gold, platinum that are, that are very popular in the US and the energy star designations that are popular in the United States as well, developed by the Department of Energy, are, are meant to, were meant to be energy standards. And so that was first and foremost what they were meant to do and they were meant to reduce the use of energy. The more recent uh, emphasis has been on the, the notion of getting to uh, a net zero. And so, for example, the Urban Land Institute's green, uh, green print uh, division has asked for commitments from certain, from membership to uh, commit to uh, net zero emissions for their buildings by 2050. So this is the notion that not only does the building uh, save significant amounts of energy, but through a variety of uh, design ideas and alternative energy uses actually uh, doesn't, doesn't use energy, which I know seems like a little bit of a strange and, and ambitious goal, but uh, there, there is increasing technology to do that. Uh, Christian, I, you can talk a little bit about what happens in, in Europe toward this. Uh, if you've seen this kind of a, a, a focus in, in the European markets as well, but, but certainly in the uh, United States, uh, we're, we're looking at not only energy savings, but all the way over to a, a net zero emission standard. Yeah, and uh, it's the same in Europe, so um, same initiatives. Um, the different countries have in Europe also announced their goals and commercial real estate is one important part there. Um, and I think we had discussed uh, um, before the green building certifications. Um, turns out it's basically in the US as in Europe, it's not too different at all. <laughs> so um, the providers are very similar. I think what um, Europe has for now a number of years um, is that um, buildings need to have an energy performance certificate, um, residential buildings, commercial buildings, um, which are basically mandatory and show on a grading how efficient a property is and what is the maximum efficiency it could achieve um, once the necessary investment has been made. And that is actually increasingly um, factored into lending decisions and um, also government decisions. Um, more currently on the residential side um, than on the commercial side, but it's certainly gaining traction that you need a certain energy um, performance grade in order to be able to let a residential property out in the UK, for example. So, and that's where um, governments in Europe are really more prescriptive with all that. So, um, and they're certainly working towards that direction. Great, thanks Christian. The second thing we wanted to talk about was this idea of healthy buildings. And, you know, healthy buildings were certainly uh, talked about pre-pandemic, but, uh, became just extremely popular and focused over the course of, of the pandemic. And we think of the, the, the characteristics and the, uh, the strategy behind healthy buildings as very closely related to uh, ESG as well. And here's some of our thinking on this. The, uh, a lot of ESG topics are uh, based on broader thematic issues, uh, climate change, corporate governance. You know, we view these all as, as very important. However, you know, the average person probably doesn't wake up every morning thinking about, uh, about climate change and corporate governance, but they do think about their day, where they're going to spend that day, and whether that environment that they're going to be in is safe and healthy. So if you are... Uh, going to work in an office, or you're going on a trip and staying at a hotel, or you're going to a retail store or a restaurant, 
you're going to be giving some, some very practical, very personal thought to where you're going to be and is that building safe? So we believe, and we did a, a commentary on, on healthy buildings last year, and we believe that healthy buildings, the healthy building idea and some of the parameters and some of the ideas and some of the strategies are, are very important and they become a very, they come a way to uh, illustrate how important ESG is on a, on a very personal uh, and, and, and private level. And so you will, uh, there's no uh, dearth of information out there now on the, the notions of what makes buildings healthy. And it, it certainly starts with uh, design elements and things like ventilation and then operational issues in terms of cleanliness and and spacing and all the things that we've come to know about during the pandemic. Uh, so all those are very important, but then there are other issues around providing outdoor space and exercise facilities and access to running trails and a whole host of issues that not only uh, come around the issue of uh, operations and design, but, but lifestyle as well. So we think that, that healthy buildings are an important component and they shed some light on uh, how we think about ESG and how we think about and use our buildings. And again, we view it as a, a very, uh, very personal and a, a very um, pragmatic approach to, uh, to ESG. And I think that once people uh, become a little bit more aware of some of these healthy building ideas, they begin to think about some of the more uh, broader ESG initiatives. So we think those are, uh, are pretty, pretty important. Um, the third, you know, is a little bit of a summary of a uh, repeat of what we talked about earlier, uh, the issues around climate change and, and global warming. Uh, to, to think about this and understand this in a broader context, I think helps us in terms of our analysis of the individual credits. Uh, certainly we have at our disposal flood maps and we have uh, information about wh where wildfires fires occur and some of the things that you think of as pretty obvious, pretty uh, well publicized events, but other areas around temperature and the idea that, that floods now are happening um, in areas that were just not prone to flooding before, maybe not in identified floodplains, uh, maybe even not that close to a, a river or other waterway. So uh, those, are, those are important. And I do I know want Christian to talk about, uh, about green bonds uh, as well. So, uh, so Christian, why don't you uh, See if you I'd like to see if you had any additional thoughts on, on those three areas, and then uh, could you talk a little bit about some uh, trends, some trends in sustainable, sustainable finance. Uh, this is an area that is is growing pretty pretty dramatically in in the U.S. and uh, DBRS Morningstar has certainly underwritten some of these in the United States, but um, I think the European perspective is really helpful because uh, they're uh, a little bit ahead of the curve on this than uh, than we are. Yeah, thank you very much, Sulevi. Just um, to add on your interesting points on the healthy buildings. So um, uh, for me, that actually also shows that you said ESG is actually in um, everybody's day-to-day -day life, but it also shows that ESG factors are somehow connected. So if, um, if the focus of office workers is really on the healthy building and feeling better in certain properties than in others. And that affects things like where they move, um, which jobs they want to take. Then actually an environmental factor indirectly becomes a social factor because um, that's uh, um, social considerations as well. So it's kind of all very interconnected. And ultimately for us, it depends how does this affect the cash flow of the property and ultimately the value. So. Um, maybe on sustainable finance trends. So um, that's really also to a little bit close the loop where the focus on environmental characteristics of a property um, also results in changes in the lending and the securitization market. So if lenders um, focus increasingly on the environmental characteristics, that ultimately means that 
um, buildings with bad credentials will have higher financing costs and buildings with better credentials will have um, better financing costs, which then ultimately means the properties might be priced differently. And that is really closing the loop that the trend towards focusing more on environmental um, considerations of lenders, of the securitization market, of property investors already um, accelerates maybe the differentiation between the pricing of um, different products. And we're seeing that um, this, in Europe, there are big discussions around that where there's a strong focus on ESG also um, on the bank side and insurance companies like institutional lenders and borrowers actively start to ask, what is my loan margin if it is an ESG friendly loan compared with an ESG unfriendly loan? So um, sponsors are starting to realize that there is this differentiating starting and also actively asking for that um, to basically select the properties they want um, to back um, the loan collateral. And once that is happening, to close the circle to the credit analysis, obviously if at a given leverage level um, the margin is lower, that affects debt service coverage ratios, which affects our credit analysis and might ultimately also affect the rating. Um, so um, that's basically the loop. Environmental focus, lending market, um, debt dynamics change might affect the credit analysis. Great, thank you. So the last of these uh, environmental topics we wanted to cover had has to do with uh, sustainable development trends. And, you know, we are a, a, a credit rating agency and, you know, first and foremost, we're looking at providing uh, our opinion on the prospective cash flows and credit quality of, of the, uh, the various transactions that we rate. You know, I think that the whole notion of ESG is helpful in a couple of ways. So with regards to a credit rating agency, um, you know, we all have some understanding of this whole notion of externalities and how they are or not incorporated into financial decisions across you know, various asset types. I think that ESG investing provides us with uh, another tool, another lens to look at some of the topics that we've thought about before, but uh, these ESG principles and practices help us to think about them in a little bit of a deeper level and uh, identify some things that perhaps we, we hadn't identified or fully uh, taken into consideration before. So I think from an analysis standpoint, from a credit rating standpoint, it's very helpful. And it points out not only uh, some existing things that we've looked at, but as uh, there becomes greater amounts of data available, greater amount of interest, certainly greater demand from a variety of investors, whether they be institutional or retail investors. There's a lot of um, opportunity to use ESG analysis to uh, improve and enhance our credit rating process. Taking a little bit broader view and, and talking a bit more about commercial real estate, um, as I've looked at uh, been in Urban Land Institute, Institute conferences or looked at other projects uh, in our, our pools and, and single assets in our portfolios. This is not a particularly scientific um, an analysis, but I, I think there's a fairly high correlation between uh, developers and owners and other interested parties in real estate who uh, have taken the time to develop an ESG program, think about an ESG program, think about how ESG design elements are incorporated into buildings. And there's a pretty high correlation between companies that have embraced some type of an ESG initiative and program and the quality of what they do. Uh, there are developers that have made it a focus to develop only LEED certified buildings. The uh, amount of innovation in, in design in terms of photovoltaic lighting and better use of ventilation, better use of screens, better use of different uh, waste handling facilities, water treatment. It, it's a very, it, it is a very exciting and a very interesting way to look at how buildings will get built. And if you look at even the, the LEED certifications that we've, we've mentioned, Although those started out originally as buildings, 
building ideas, uh, there are now lead standards for sustainable neighborhoods and communities. So it goes far beyond just the characteristics of a particular building. So there's all those notions around how do we make a, a real estate portfolio, a real estate owner, a real estate institutional investor's portfolio uh, more in line with environmental, social, and governance techniques. Uh, those, those are important. And uh, an organization like GRASB, which some of you may know about, if you uh, look at their data, they have very, uh, very detailed recommendations on how not only uh, particular pieces of collateral are developed and treated, but also the organizational structure behind uh, a portfolio manager and how that's treated, you know, very important. And then to take one step further, uh, we also pay some attention to, and I think we'll continue to pay more attention to, what are the efforts in a particular community around sustainable infrastructure and protection from the climate. So in time, uh, there'll be greater data, greater transparency around the work that individual municipalities or states, or I, I'm curious to see what has been happening in Europe where uh, there's actually a, a sustained effort to put in place uh, cutting edge infrastructure projects that will uh, mitigate the effects of, of climate change and uh, other, other climate related events. So it's just an incredibly, uh, broad and interesting field. Uh, we certainly take one piece of it in our credit rating business, but uh, the, uh, the broader topics in terms of, of green finance, uh, certainly uh, you see the uh, interest of certain municipalities. New York is the one that comes to mind most frequently about putting in place a very strict uh, carbon standards that uh, they would like all building owners to comply with. And on, on our side, we, uh, we rate C-PACE transactions that uh, really are meant to fund those type of energy efficiency improvements. So there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of synergy, a lot of linkage between all of these. And it's, I think, a very, uh, very exciting time to, uh, to think about this. And um, I think that we're only seeing the, uh, the beginning of, the, um, of, of a deepening interest and implementation of ESG principles and and really frankly the transparent transparency and data that will uh, that will support it. So uh, Christian, I don't know if there's uh, any else you want to thing you want to add from a, a European perspective, and then uh, Chris, if there are questions that we have, we can uh, begin to answer those as well. But uh, that should give you a little bit of a, a, a thinking into how we we look at uh, environmental factors, and then a little bit more of the kind of broader picture that, that we as a, a firm are, uh, are using to, uh, to shape these, these, these decisions. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, no, I could not, uh, I think your last words summarized it very, very nicely. And uh, we had the start, certainly, and uh, what will come out of all that, which will help the analysis ultimately, is there will be a lot of data generated which uh, makes it certainly a very exciting time. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we appreciate the questions that have come in and I think we've kind of hit on them a little bit in terms of, um, you know, potential for valuation differentiation. If you are um, something that is a ESG friendly as Christian puts it or ESG non-friendly, right? Um, so as we start to have lending platforms that are differentiating, we can now start to measure if there is value differential there, right? And then, you know, with currently with the cap rates, I would say a lot of, um, you know, investment that the owners have put in their buildings, that's probably reflected in the quality of the building and the cap rate adjustment that corresponds to that. But I think what you'll start to see now that this is um, really at the forefront of specifically, you know, individual consumer minds, but also tenants minds is, differentiation across lead buildings, right? So if you now, if you're, if you're out there looking for a, a new lease uh, or you have a, you know, have to have a new lease and you're looking, where am I gonna go? Um, I think employees want um, to know that they're in a healthy building, that they're in a green building. So you may see more 
tenant retention in those buildings. You may see more uh, higher occupancy in those buildings, which ultimately is cash flow, but cash flow and cap rate are, are correlated to, to value. So I think in terms of that, we will start to see that differentiation, which perhaps maybe, you know, the last 10 years, we haven't seen, seen a, a measurable amount of that. I don't know, Kevin or Christian, if you have um, any more insights into those couple questions that were related. Well, maybe um, I think there, there was a question on the cap rate and I think I had commented on that. And mm -hmm. ultimately the impact of um, environmental factors on higher values will come from the two angles, cash flow and then the cap rate. And I would think the cash flow angle is the saving, higher retention rate, higher occupancy rate. Flip side to the coin is then the other building which do not have the credentials, which might see higher turnover, lower rent, uh, and higher costs. And then you have the financing aspect, which is um, if you get better lending rates, that would ultimately then also result in the yield or cap rate differentiation. But so far in Europe, we have not seen that in the data yet. Um, and the data is one of the items which will need to be researched um, is a pricing differential we have seen the first analysis on the residential mortgage side coming out whether green mortgages, um, residential mortgages are more or less risky than non-green mortgages. And um, it was a Bank of England study and it seems um, they are a little bit less risky. Uh, the question is, to what extent is that st statistically significant? But we are awaiting these data um, to then be factored into our analysis. Yeah, and I think the exciting thing of all this is that these, um new data sources and new transparency is gonna give us the tools to uh, do a lot more as we go forward. There is a question on um, in integrating information from Sustainalytics, um, uh, just for everyone's benefit, uh, Morningstar, our parent, um, facilitated or completed its purchase of Sustainalytics back um, in mid 2020. Um, so we do, as a um, you know, have that access to that information. And again, I think you'll we'll, we'll be able to um, discuss that more in, in future webinars. But I don't know, Kevin or Christian, any um, quick thoughts on on Sustainalytics and and working with the folks there? Yeah, it's great to have them uh, on board. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the the risk factors that we've identified, even the 18 risk factors we've identified for all of DBRS Morningstar, a number of those um, are, are the same uh, criteria that Sustainalytics uses in its analysis. Uh, their analysis will be interesting to us to uh, help us talk about sponsors and issuers. Uh, that's really their, their focus. Uh, we still will have to do the work that we do on our side on the underlying collateral. Yeah, I completely agree. So it's, uh, it's one of the inputs, but then we have to overlay that uh, with our analysis. Great. Well, I think that um, that pretty well concludes our, our remarks for today. We really appreciate the questions. And as, as Christian says, we're at the beginning of exploring all of these things. And, you know, I think transparency is obviously the um, number one goal. So if, as you're thinking about your own ESG requirements or getting questions in, within your firm, if there are things that, um, you know, in our analysis or in our reports that we can help provide to give you more transparency into some of these ESG factors, we're certainly welcome, or welcome that uh, feedback and happy to take a look to see if there's something additional that we can provide. Um, with that, thank you, um, Kevin and Christian. I appreciate your, your comments today. Thanks. Thank you.